All right. Hey, hey everybody. Okay, so um, I was just telling the, the folks here at school, uh, I'm going to start recording my videos at this point so that you guys playing along at home can also check your answers. Um, feel free to pause the video where you need to uh, and, and kind of look through the, the work. Um, if you have any questions while you're at home, you can uh, email me, you can send me a reminder, we can conference if you need to. But. So here are the answers for the, the homework. Ask questions, folks, if you have them. Um, I, again, I anticipate you meeting some of these problems uh, shown on the board as kind of a refresher. So, so there's 30, 32, and 34. <laughs> Remember what we're doing here is we're completing the square. And completing the square is just another method to solve quadratics. Um, solving quadratics, uh, you know, we talked about solving them by factoring, and factoring does not always work, right? Some, some quadratics are not factorable, so we had to come up with a way that um, that will always work, and, and completing the square will always work. Okay, let me keep scrolling down here. Oh, there's 36. I guess i got to flip the page for the next set. Let's leave that for right now. Uh, remember that there are two types of problems when we're we're completing the square. The first one is when I'm asking you to solve by completing the square. That's when I want you to end with x equals, kind of like the one, uh, whatever this one is, what is it? Three, four, three, four, uh, 30, I guess, where I get x equals negative 3 plus or minus radical 29 over 2. Ooh, that looks like a rough one. Um, and then there's ones where I ask you to put it into vertex form, like 32, 34, 36. Notice the different results. In 32, 34, and 36, I've asked you to manipulate the equations to find the vertex, to put it into vertex form. You do that by way of completing the square, but you're not solving for x there. Okay? When you solve for x, you set it equal to 0, you get the constant over to the other side, and you start chipping away that way. <laughs> when I ask you to put it into vertex form, the h of x, the f of x, the g of x is stuck on the left side, and you can't do any operations to it. Here is 40, 42. 40 is a nice throwback. Um, I wanted you to find max height of the, uh, the projectile motion. And that, remember, max height is always the vertex. The maximum value is the vertex. So you do the negative b over 2a, and you plug it back in. Negative b over 2a turns out to be negative 24 over negative 32, which in this case is 0.75, so 3 quarters of a second. You plug in 0.75, and you get out. 15. 15 feet is my maximum height, and it reaches that maximum height at 3 quarters of a second. Number 42, um, 44, those were ones where you just solve directly for x. It almost was like too easy. You're like, uh, I feel like I should be doing more with this. Looks like I got 30 or 44 wrong when I first did it. Oh, I guess I would want to rationalize. Yeah, radical 21 over. But again, there's 44, 46, 48. And then here's 52 and 54. Can I do 54? Is that okay? Sound good? I'm going to do 54. I, and I guess since I'm, I'm doing the video, I'm just going to, uh, I'll do it up here on the smart board. So if you gel the toy board, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Tough crowd early in the morning. Isn't it? Uh, let's send it to a new page. Fail us right there. What do you think? Uh, okay, there we go. <coughs> There's 54. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do, uh, since I'm solving to find the zeros, right, my way of completing the square, variables to the left, constants to the right. So uh, 2x squared, I subtract over the 5x, and then I leave the 12 on the right side. Notice how I leave my room, right? I want to eventually complete the square. Can I complete the square as it sits right now? No. What's stopping me? The 2. 
the two out in front of the x squared. You cannot complete the square when there's a number out in front of the x squared. So what do we do with it? We divide it through. Since I can divide it on both sides, I divide everything by two. See, the ones where I um, am just putting it into vertex form, I can't divide over to the other side, and that's when I factor out the two instead of dividing it out. All right, so this one, we, we divide it out. We get x squared minus 5 halves x, no decimals, <coughs> is equal to 6. See, this one's a bummer. This one's a bummer because 5 is not divisible by 2. So now I've got this weird thing as my b value, negative 5 over 2. Okay, so what do I add to both sides? Well, I take negative 5 over 2 divided by 2, and whatever that is, I square it, right? Negative, negative 5 over 2 is my b value. I divide it by 2, and then I square it. Whatever that is, I add to both sides. Well, what is negative 5 over 2 divided by 2? Well, isn't that the same thing as saying dividing by 2 is multiplying by 1 half? Right? So negative 5 over 2 times 1 half is, well, if, I don't need common denominators. I got them, but I don't need them because I'm just going to multiply 2 across on top. It's not adding or subtracting. Negative 5 over 4. Fun trick. If you're taking half of a fraction, all you do is just double the denominator. Right? If you take half of a fraction, all you want to do is just double the denominator. I use that trick when I'm doing woodworking. I do a lot of woodworking. Like I made this podium up here. Um, like if you want to find the exact center line of a, of a, of a, of a like, a, you're like, okay, how long is this piece? I want to know exactly where the value is. If you've got like a fraction value, it's like five and three eighths inches. Well, if you take half of it, well, if you want to take half of any fraction, you just double the denominator. So if you wanted to take like half of three eighths, it'd be three sixteenths, right? So you just double the denominator and that's really taking half of it because really you're multiplying by one over two, which just in essence doubles the denominator. So negative five over four, negative five over four squared is the value that I add to both sides. So in this case, 25 16. 25 16. Now you may be thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 that's a weird thing that I'm going to try to factor. Don't bother factoring. Remember that this turns into x. Now this is a minus because it's a minus over here. x minus b over 2, which in our case was 5 over 4 squared. All right, now let's let's work with this. 6 plus 25 16. Okay, that's going to be a little weird. Uh, I'm going to let, let's not use our fraction buttons on our calculator. Let, let's make 16 out of a or 6 out of out of 16. Okay, well, I'd multiply that by 6. So 6 times 10 is 60. 6 times 6 is 36. So 96 sixteenths would be 6. 96 16 16. Okay, we add that together. Uh, we get 101 plus 20, 121 16. Which is nice. Why do I say that that's nice? Why do I say that that is nice? Well, that's nice because when I go to square root this, because that's the next step. I, think I get x minus 5 fourths is equal to plus or minus square root the top and bottom. They're both perfect squares. 11 fourths. And now I add the 5 fourths over to the other side. See, now, because they were both perfect squares, I can do this thing where I just reduce it all the way down. Like I have uh, an x minus 5 fourths is equal to uh, 11 fourths, and then an x minus 5 fourths is equal to negative 11 fourths. I add the 5 fourths over to the other side. That gives me 16 fourths, or in other words, 4. And then I subtract, I'm sorry, I add it over to the other side again. Uh, that would give me negative 6 fourths, or negative 3 halves. That's a fun one. Let me just double check. Four and negative three halves. I just want to make sure that that's what I have on my other page. Okay, four and negative three halves. I'm good. 
Questions about that? That's about as difficult as it can get with completing the square. Okay, that's about as hard as these, these problems can get. When you have to divide through by A, and when you divide through by A, you get a weird fraction, which in turn makes you divide by another fraction, which makes you add a weird thing on the other side. So that's about as hard as it could possibly get to. All right. Any other questions on the homework that we'd like to talk through before we get to today's notes? Yeah. 46. Let's take a look at 46. Okay, so yeah, this is one of those weird ones where it's trying to kind of like prep you to complete the square, and sometimes it's harder than it needs to be. Let me show you. Let's put a new page. Here we go. moment. See if he's got a case of the Mondays. Okay, here we go. You know, it's on Monday. All right. Um, so this is one of those ones where <laughs> I've got a binomial squared. I've got two terms squared. So if I could get that 9 sixteenths over to the other side, life is good. So I say x plus 1 fourth squared, and then I just add the 9 sixteenths over to the other side. So I've got this. And now this looks a lot like the end of a completing the square problem. I square root the other side, I get x plus 1 fourth is equal to plus or minus 3 fourths. Because the 9 and the 16 are both perfect squares. I, I subtract the 1 fourth over to either side. This is kind of like the one that we just did, where you're going to have two results. Because these were both perfect squares, I could actually square root that. So we subtract over, it would be 2 fourths, 3 fourths minus 1 fourth is 2 fourths, which is just 1 half. And then this one, uh, this would give me three, negative 3 fourths minus 1 fourth, so negative 4 fourths, or negative 1. Does that make sense? Anything else on the homework that we'd like to talk through? No? Okay, uh, before I hand out the guided notes, I want you to think about this problem. And for the folks playing along at home, I just wrote this. While I walk around and hand out the guided notes, I want you to think about what you would do to solve for, solve for X. movie was on last night that like it's one of those movies that I will watch it every single time I see them. Doctor Strange. That's a, I think that's one of my favorite Marvel movies. Doctor Strange. Thank you. What happens when we solve this? What happens when I try to solve x squared plus one? Like obviously there's no b term here. So I can solve directly. I can subtract the 1 over to the other side. I get x squared is equal to negative 1. So I get this. And for our purposes right now, what would we say about this? You can't do it, right? Why not? Because there's a negative underneath the radical. Like if you put it in your calculator, watch what happens. Like if I actually go to my calculator and, and try to do the square root of negative 1. Square root negative 1 is non-real answer. Non-real answer. Okay. All right. Well, if I think about this graphically, what transformation is this? What transformation is that? A plus 1. Yes. So I would be saying, okay, well, this looks something like this, right? I'll use red and green Christmas colors. There we go. Right? This looks generally like that, right? Because this was an up one. When I ask you to find the zeros of the function, 
What's another name for finding the zeros? Finding the x-intercepts, right? Does that graph have any x-intercepts? So this is the case where, there, where you're not going to have any x-intercepts. And I should really actually start changing my phrasing. And should, I should start saying now, you're not going to have any real x-intercepts. You will have x-intercepts. They just will be non-real. Okay. Today is, the start. Today is the day we get to talk about imaginary numbers. Yeah, I know. Cool, right? Um, I just kind of went through this with you. But we can see that in the graph of y equals or f of x equal to x squared plus 1, that f has no real zeros. It does not cross the x-axis. If you solve the corresponding equation, you get plus or minus the square root of negative 1. We talked about that already. It has no real solutions. We might be tempted to say that it has no solutions, but that's not actually the case. It has no real solutions. Okay? It has no real, real solutions. It has no x-intercepts. However, however, what if you define the square root of negative 1 to be something. What if you define the square root of negative 1 to be something? For right now, we've been saying, oh, it's undefined. It's undefined. You know, do it, do it. There's no solution. It's undefined. But what if you define it? What if you say that the square root of negative 1 is i? Okay? What if you say that the square root of negative 1 is i? Who came up with this? This guy named, this guy named Euler did it. He did like everything in, in mathematics. Like if you, yeah, he's like a he's like a trivia answer all the time. Euler, Euler. Uh, that's how you spell his name, Euler. Yeah, Euler. Um, but he said a long time ago he was like, okay, well, what if we what if we define the square root of negative one to be something? We said, what if we define the square root of negative one to be i? Well, if you define the square root of negative one to be i. It, it opens up a whole new branch of mathematics, a whole new way of thinking, a whole, whole new other side to things where what was undefined before is now defined. Okay? You can use the imaginary unit to write the square root of any negative number. Um, <laughs> you have this on your papers here. Uh, an imaginary number is the square root of any negative number. So whenever you have the square root of a negative number, it's an imaginary unit. Okay. Imaginary numbers can be written in the form B i, where B is the real number and i is the imaginary part. We'll talk about how it turns into a complex number in a little bit. So if I said to you the square root of negative 4, that's like third example down there. Uh, the square root of negative 4, the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of negative 1 is i. So we would say that the square root of negative 4 is just 2 i. Basically, to pull out the negative from underneath the radical, you bring an i outside the radical. For example here, if I wanted to just write the square root of negative 2, obviously the square root of 2 is, is just square root of 2. It's simplified as it is, right? To simplify further, you remove the negative out from underneath the radical. You put an i out in front of the radical. That denotes that it would have been the square root of negative 2, but we have an i sitting out there instead. So what would happen if you square the square root of negative 1? This is going to be a, a very key concept that we will learn when we get to section 5.9. That i squared is actually negative 1. If you square any imaginary unit, you get the, the negative, or sorry, the square root goes away from uh, acting on the negative, so that it just becomes a negative number in, in the inside. Okay? So let's work with it a little bit more. Let's say 5 times the square root of negative 121. 5 times the square root of negative 121. Well, what is the square root of 121? 11, right? So this square root of negative 121, because it's a negative on the inside, this is like saying 11i. 11i. That's how we would write that. The square root of a negative 121 is 11i. Well, 5 times 11i is 55i. You're going to see me write like a little tail in my eye. That's, that's just a, a habit, just so it doesn't look you know, like turning into like a, a 1. Okay. 
So yes, you can multiply a real number times an imaginary unit. This 11, that 5 times 11, you can make that a 55. So let's take the square root of negative 12. So again, what you do is you kind of break it down separately. You say, well, I know that the square root of, of 12, I can reduce that down. So I'm really going to take it like this. Right? You're going to kind of break it apart like that. And then you say, well, the square root of 12, that's 4 times 3. Or 2 radical 3. And the square root of negative 1 is i. Now, i2 radical 3 would be fine. But here's how it's normally written. This is equivalent to saying 2i radical 3. Usually the i's come last unless there was a square root and then the square root would come 2i radical 3 that's how we would write that the 2 because we could pull a 4 out the i because there was a negative on the inside of the radical and then the 3 because it had no buddy to go with to come out let's see and d here the square root of 36? 6. So the square root of negative 36 would just be 6i. It would be 6i. 2 times 6i is 12i. And then we want to take the square, the negative square root of negative 96. Now be careful here. The negatives do not cancel. One is a negative underneath the radical and one is a negative outside the radical. Those negatives do not cancel. So what do we do with this? Well, we break it down. We got we to break down the square root of 96. Like this basically becomes, you know, if I wanted to write it like this, that would be completely fine. And now we break down the square root of 96. Well, didn't we just do 90? I feel like we just had 96 as a number. Oh, that was like, that was 6 times 16, right? That was 6 times 16. We worked with that in the, going over the problems today. 6 times 16. So this is going to be negative 4i radical 6. Questions about that? Okay, now that we know how to reduce imaginary numbers, let's start solving equations that deal with them. Like, for example, here, x squared is equal to negative 144. If I've got x squared is equal to negative 144, I really just want to square root the, the negative 144. We can do that now. We have defined what a square root of negative number is. So this is plus or minus the square root of negative 144, which in our terms now is 12i. Simple as that. Okay, whenever you square root a negative number, you get an i. So let's take a look at the next one here. 5x squared plus 90 is 0. We subtract the 90 over to the other side. We get 5x squared is equal to negative 90. We divide by 5. Let's see what 90 divided by. Oh. 90 divided by 5 is negative 18. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 18. Okay, well, 18 is 9 times 2. That was a big one. 18 is 9 times 2, so it's 3 radical 2. But because of the negative on the inside, that gets us plus or minus 3i.
Okay, let's take a look at C now. Questions about that one before I move on? Bueno? C? Okay. Take a look at part C. Okay, I would subtract over the 25. I would get 9x squared is equal to negative 25. I would divide by 9, so negative 25 ninths. And now I go to square root it. 5 thirds, oops, I forgot my plus or minus. 5 thirds i. Plus or minus 5 thirds i. When I get to 5 thirds, square root 25, square root 9. 5 over 3. Don't forget, whenever you take the whenever you take the radical, you take the plus or minus in front of it as well. So what are we saying here? We're saying that whenever you have the square root of a negative number, which we'll talk about in a second there on the next page, whenever you have the square root of a negative number, you're going to have an I in your answer. Okay? It's going to be a non-real answer. Um, Another way that we can talk about them in terms, we talk about it in terms of complex numbers. A complex number is one that combines both real and imaginary units. Like for example, we're writing, we're writing them in an in a plus b i uh, form, a plus b i form, where a is the, is the real part and b i is the imaginary part. Okay. When you combine them by way of addition or subtraction, because that would just make the imaginary part negative. When you combine it by way of addition or subtraction, you get what's called a complex number. It has both real and imaginary parts, A plus B I. So you look over here at the, uh, the diagram, 3 plus 7 I, that's a complex number. 4 minus I, that's a complex number. 4 is the real part, negative I is the imaginary part. 3 plus 7 I, 3 is the real, 7 I is the imaginary. So they have both real and imaginary parts to it. So uh, again, this is the this is the way we write complex numbers: real parts plus imaginary parts. A plus B I. A plus B I. Now these next sets of problems here look a lot more confusing than they actually are. When I say two complex numbers are equivalent to one another, that's implying that both the real parts are equivalent and the imaginary parts are equivalent as well. Take a look at what I mean here. Look at all the stuff that does not have an I on it. Like 2x, there's no I being multiplied to that. And negative 8, there's no I being multiplied to that. Okay, if I switch gears and I say, okay, look at all the stuff that has the I on it. Negative 6I, 20YI. Okay. For this to be truly equivalent, 2x, 2x has to equal negative 8, and negative 6i is equal to 20yi. Okay, for this to truly be equivalent, both real parts have to be equivalent and imaginary parts have to be equivalent. So I just solve these really quickly here. I just say x is negative 4. Four. And then, now, do I really need to write the i's in, though? Because if I were to divide them out right away, wouldn't they just cancel? So I really could have gone straight to saying this. Okay? If you have an i on both sides of the equation, you can just cancel them out directly right away. So I divide by 20, messy fraction here, negative 3 tenths is equal to what? That's a really kind of confusing problem just to say set the real parts equal, set the imaginary parts equal. Take a look here. Set real parts equal, set imaginary parts equal. <laughs> so my real parts here, the stuff without the I, I've got a negative 8 and a 5x. 
stuff with the i. 6yi. And then I've got a negative radical, or i times radical 6. Okay, well, my first equ equation is going to look like this. Negative 8 is equal to 5x. The other equation is going to be 6y. I don't have to write the i on the left side. I don't have to write the i on the right side as well. So that would mean uh, negative 8 fifths is x, and y is negative radical 6 over 6. Questions about that? Again, this is just one of those problems where I'm, I'm saying if I want to say two complex numbers are equivalent, real parts must be equal. That gives us our first equation. Imaginary parts must be equal. That gives us our second equation. All right, so now let's get into the, the meat and potatoes of why we're doing this. Okay. Because look, I want to find the zeros of the function. Now, for, up until this point, the zeros of the function were synonymous with the x-intercepts of the equation. That's no longer necessarily true because if I find the zeros in this function and it has an i included in it, that's not necessarily the x-intercept then. It's implying that the graph does not have x-intercepts. That's what it tells you. Oh, foreshadowing there. Let's see what happens. I'm just guessing that when we solve this, we'll get a, uh, we'll get an i. Now, my first line of defense is factoring. Um, are there any factors of 26 that have to get to 10? I almost want to say 6 and 4, but that's 24. Nope. Right, because the factors of 26 are 1 and 26, or 2 and 13, and that's about it. Right? So there are no factors of 26 that have to get to 10, so I cannot factor. So my only thing I can do is complete the square. So x squared plus 10x is equal to negative 26. I subtract over, right? Variables to the left, constants to the right. What do I add to both sides? What do I add to both sides in this case? 25. 10 over 2 is 5. Squared is 25. Okay, so that means we got x plus 5 squared is equal to negative 1. Ah, take a look here. I go to square root the right side, and I get x plus 5 is equal to plus or minus what? Plus or minus i. I would say plus or minus the square root of negative 1, but we don't even have to worry about that. We subtract over the 5. x is equal to negative 5 plus or minus i. And that's how we finish it off. Let's take a look at the next one here. Any questions on this before I move on? Perfect. Okay, let's keep it rolling. Take a look at the next one. So I would start here by, again, it says find the zeros. So x squared plus 4x plus 12 is equal to zero. I would start again by trying to factor. Factors of 12 that had to get to 4. 1, 12, 2, and 6, 3, 4, 9. Doesn't work. Bummer. So I subtracted 12. I have, to, I have to do completing the square. x squared plus 4x is negative 12. What adds to both sides? 4. Half of 4 is 2. Squared is 4. So this gets me an x plus 2 squared is negative 8. Okay, again, alarm bells are ringing. As soon as I see a negative on the right side, when I go to square root it, I'm going to get a non-real number. X plus 2 is equal to plus or minus. I'll just write it like this for right now, because now we're going to reduce it down. The square root of 8 is 2 radical 2. Because right, it would be 4 times 2. The square root of 8 is 2 radical 2. And because it's the square root of negative 8, it's plus or minus 2i radical 2. And I subtract the 2 over to the right side. x is equal to negative 2 plus or minus 
two i radical two. That's a lot of twos right there. Negative two plus or minus two i radical two. So that's the really important part of today. Okay, that's that. The, you know, now what we're saying here is if I go to graph this, because I have an i in my answer, what does that tell us about our original problem? It has no x-intercept. Okay, it has no real x-intercept. Yes, there is an imaginary plane. Like you can, if you get further on into this, yes, you actually can graph with imaginary units. Okay, it's not fun, but you can. Okay. Uh, last thing here is, is talking about complex conjugates. Now, complex conjugates are not really going to mean anything to us right now, but I promise you, by the end of this chapter, you're going to you're going to think they're pretty slick. Okay. Complex conjugates are basically the opposites of the imaginary part. If I've got a plus bi, then the complex conjugate is a minus bi. Whenever I talk about a conjugate, we're going to talk about conjugates in a lot of different ways. Whenever I talk about a conjugate, it's just basically one that is the opposite sign. So if I've got a plus bi, the complex conjugate is a minus bi. Like negative 5 plus i radical 10 is going to be negative 5 minus i radical 10. It basically changed the sign of the imaginary part. Okay. So what is the complex conjugate of 8 plus 5i? Quite simply, 8 minus 5i. What do you think the complex conjugate of just 6i is? Is 6i the real or the imaginary part? It's the imaginary, right? So I could rewrite this to say like 0 plus 6i, right? if I really wanted to. So that means my complex conjugate would be like zero minus six i, or just negative six i. That's my complex conjugate. Do we have any idea what these do right now? No, no, but trust me, they, they do something. Now, take a look here. This one's kind of set up in an odd way. It's not in true a plus bi form. To do that, I would say radical 3 plus i. Now it's in true complex form, a plus bi form. And now when I change the sign of the, the imaginary part, I would say radical 3 minus i. That's my complex conjugate. We're going to find that complex conjugate pairs, when you do operations on them, they have special properties. Okay? They're going to be pretty important a little bit later on. All right, so long for the folks playing along at home. Stay healthy, stay safe. See ya.